Hello, welcome to another amazing episode of Pittsburgh Tech Talk. Today we have Christopher Evans with Savier. I've known Chris for years, uh, great guy, great companies all over Pittsburgh, everywhere from Blue Tree Lending to now Savier, and he's had startups he's exited from, so really great guy. We have a really good background, so I think today is going to be one of those episodes that just really clicks. So welcome to Pittsburgh Tech Talk, and thanks for tuning in. One, two, three, four, get my shoes on out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Nine, gonna shine, life is good. I'm doing fine, so I'm gonna do it right and do it again, yeah. I look into the sky with all the beautiful color, but there's more than just for me, so gonna share it with another. I got to show, to give, let out, I want to sing and shout. Take a look and see a beautiful morning that turns into a beautiful evening, and together make a beautiful life. And if you want to see, then come along with me, that's right. And if you want a good tomorrow, it's pretty simple, got a partner like to follow. And if you do, you have a future real bright. And it's a combination of consistency, come on. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Christopher. For those who don't know, this is Christopher Evans. Uh, we've known each other for quite a few years. He's had many different awesome positions here around Pittsburgh. Uh, I guess why don't we just, instead of me just hyping you up, why don't you just talk a little <laughs> bit about yourself? Because I mean, I don't know all the things you've done, I just know you've done amazing things. So, so allow me to talk about myself for a little while. Uh, just huh? a little bit. <laughs> Phil, that could be dangerous. We might run out of tape. Uh, it, it's great to be on your show, first off, and thank, and thank you. you for what you're doing for the Pittsburgh community, the tech community in particular, bringing on awesome guests like this. Really honored to be a awesome part of Awesome guests it. like so, you? Well, awesome guests on a show like this. How about I, I that? I get you. I get you. <laughs> we'll the, we'll let the viewers you. figure out if it was awesome after. Exactly. But, um, yeah, so what can I say? Tech has been my life for the last 18, 20 years. Uh, got into the industry uh, as part of a, a, a move to learn how to do sales and marketing after I came out of college, a bit self-taught and a bit watching some great mentors. Um, had a chance to kind of come up during the golden age of the dot-com years and the Y2K years, so, so I'm showing my age a little bit, but got into um, sales with the iGate Corporation at MassTech and, and really learned um, how to, to handle sales. Uh, you are one of the best salesmen in Pittsburgh. I'm just oh. going to say that. You're everywhere. <laughs> when you talk to anyone, it's like, oh, like uh, through lending or VCs or anything. Like, you're out there. And you, Thank you. you have the sales presence, which I feel that I lack in a lot of cases. I feel like I kind of just go in and I give my spiel, like, this is what I can do for you. Do you like it or not? But I feel like you, like you have a professional sales presence. Wow. Well, I appreciate that. I, you know, I've always tried to be very genuine with whatever I'm dealing with. I don't ever like to represent a brand or a service unless I believe in it. Mm -hmm. And winning times in my career I found myself dangerously close to representing something that wasn't what I believed it should be, mm -hmm. I got the hell out. And um, I can tell you that's one of the reasons people trust me to this day. They know if Christopher tells you something's good or uh, earnest or this is the way it ought to be, I think they take it seriously. You're very passionate and it shows. Thank and you. And I think that's a, that's a big thing, especially in Pittsburgh, is that it's a small city and you, you, you don't want to burn your bridge by selling some garbage service no. or some overnight service. And I think you've, I mean, for how many things you've done, I have yet to hear anything bad about well, you. thank you. There's never, and that's, you know, it's a little uncommon. A lot of people, especially in sales, they kind of represent some things, they kind of fall into it. But I remember when you were changing jobs, I mean, you were really adamant about finding a company yeah. you really liked and you wanted to feel passionate about. Yeah. Kind of that entrepreneurial kind of spirit. Yeah. It's, it's really true. I think one of the best compliments uh, that my, my CEO has shared with me at Savier is you could put on the head of a pin the amount of people he's ever made mad. And I said, well, I think that about me too. So hopefully we'll be a, a great partnership and it, it's been wonderful. Um, you know, coming up through the ranks, Phil, I, um, I learned from some big companies. Um, I got the entrepreneurial itch around the time I was 26. My then uh, uh, boss and Two other people and I started a company from scratch, um, a customer relationship management uh, software implementation partner. That's a mouthful. But basically, we went around the country helping some pretty large entities like uh, Cox Communications and Canon and uh, Fujitsu look at CRM, as, mm -hmm. as the, the buzzword goes, and determine which packages would be appropriate for them to look at and ultimately select. Uh, but we now did you're mostly in Pittsburgh, though, right? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely. Just in the Pittsburgh. So that company, uh, that company sold a couple of years ago. Um, I found myself back at at Mass Tech, this time wearing the hat of uh, the chief marketing officer, uh, the the director of global marketing, uh, for two of the the company's many entities. And I got my chops in branding, and I fell in love with branding and marketing just as much as I had with sales previously. And ever since then, I've sort of been the kind of um, 
a person you call to build a team and to help take a look at a brand, where it wants to go, and build out a very specific marketing plan and a sales strategy. So that's the capacity I, so that I currently have. Let me have. ask you, what's your favorite, what are some of your favorite new brands in Pittsburgh? Not companies you work with, because obviously you're going to be biased. <laughs> I'd be biased, but right? But what are some awesome brands you think have really did a great job oh, branding themselves? Oh my goodness. I mean, you know, Phil, when you think about Pittsburgh, how can you start anywhere other than the Pittsburgh Steelers? Uh, that's, I mean, an iconic brand up there uh, along with Coca-Cola, you know, McDonald's, the world's leaders. So, I mean, when I think of Pittsburgh initially, I think of, 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 of the Steelers. I'll, I'll, I'll flip the, the script a little. Pittsburgh itself is a great brand. Oh, that's a good, okay. good shout-out. And here's why. What could be more amazing in the world than a, a city that comes from modest roots, from such diverse ethnic backgrounds, people who've traveled here, made homes here because of the rivers and because of the industries that used to power the world, the, the, the coal, the steel, the aluminum. I love it. Like all of us, we have an affinity for that old steel town. But what's more impressive is how, the, how so many companies have to pivot, yeah. how brands have to pivot. Pittsburgh pivoted, not once, but a couple times. Oh, yeah. And In, our mayor's amazing. He's doing uh, a lot to move, to move the tech scene. I mean, I know yes. we kind of dabbled a little bit off yes. camera, but... Yeah. But I really think Perduto, I mean, he's he's leading the charge, which is what a mayor should do. It's refreshing to have someone with forward thought like Mayor Peduto, who not only understands tech but evangelizes it. Uh, he gets it and he loves it and he finds new ways of, of incorporating it in his administration and to leverage the city. And we at Savvier love that. We're knocking on his door all the time with new ideas of, of ways that we can improve and connect the city and and, and, and really leverage technology to benefit our, our, our population. Anything you can share with us? With Not that? yet. Is it, okay, it's all secret it's behind it. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll keep you posted. Yeah, he, I, I enjoy he, that. Here's, here's what I can tell you. Um, a lot of the, the work that we do um, is for Pittsburgh-based companies. Now, we have clients all over the country, uh, Savvier by way of a bit of introduction. We do a lot of web development, web applications, mobile applications, and big data integration, which is a bit of an overused uh uh, terminology, but what it really means is taking information and making it usable, taking data about your customers or about your products or products or situations that are in the marketplace and making business decisions, products based off of real data. In other words, engineering what you sell and what you deliver based on what people really want. Okay. And do you think that the city can use something like that? Is there like data that we can use to try Absolutely. to streamline? Like, yeah. Here's an issue I've heard about, which I just, just recently heard, is that our lights downtown are apparently on timers instead of actual um, sensors. And I guess this is a major, major issue that people, I never go downtown. So for me, I ride my bike. I've never noticed this issue. I just go right through them. Um, but it's, it seems like that's a big issue. That's something that you think the data that like you guys well, could help. Data that? absolutely could power that. You know, there's a lot of talk of right now in, across the world about connecting cities. And that means a lot of things to different uh, people. But the concept of leveraging data, real-time data and historical data on what traffic patterns are flowing, where people are going busy times versus slow times can absolutely be used to inform traffic signals and things like that. There are, uh, I think, in Holland and a few other places around the world that are starting to dabble with that. I'll tell you something that intrigues me even more so is a different way of looking at a connected city. I mentioned a minute ago we do a lot of work with apps. And apps are like big data, sort of cliche. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talk about it, few people really understand what it means, oh, right? Yeah, you don't have to we used to do app development. So you I know. quote apps all the time, and it's one of the craziest, the app ideas that we hear, and I mean, it's just- Some of them are a bit off the wall. It's saturated, and it's the execution that's hard, not the development. And real value. Mm -hmm. Does the app actually do something important, meaningful, and sustainable? In the case of connecting a city, take a look at being able to understand who's visiting Pittsburgh, why they're here, what they are doing while they're here, what they want to be doing, based on permission-based information, mm -hmm. and tailor a one-to-one -one customized experience for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you come into Pittsburgh six, eight times a year and you go to the same two restaurants, that's not great for you and that's not great for the city. Mm -hmm. You're missing out on all the wealth of other opportunities in different neighborhoods and, and different cultures and all the things that Pittsburgh has to say. You know, being a, a, mm -hmm. a native Pittsburgher, you could live here a lifetime and not see it all. So on that note, I actually just recently started doing something, which is really cool, which I never thought a big company like Hilton would let me do. But they want to start showing the cool behind the scenes stuff. So we've, I've worked with Hilton for seven years. 
And now they're letting me actually come up with cool things like brewery tours, like mm -hmm. trying to do upsells. Instead of just saying get 20% off for staying, we can actually do really cool. They're having me find the cool niche things in Pittsburgh to do yeah. and then get guests coming from out of town and we'll have different age groups, but it'll all be the underground stuff that isn't really advertised, mm -hmm. like a bike tour, brewery mm -hmm. tour. Mm -hmm. and, th and with just really cool stuff. And I think even big corporations that are hurting are starting to realize that while well, we have places like you know, Ace Hotel and Hotel Monaco, you have these kind of hip, younger places willing to do it, which is forcing the hand of these established leaders. And Pittsburgh's one of the perfect towns for it because we now have all these little kind of mom and pop or like little shops opening up, little bars, little restaurants, little micro breweries. So I think that's a great idea for an app if you can think, you know, it's the execution that's gonna be hard. You know, is it gonna just, is it gonna lead back to leading them to Subway because they're the ones that have the money? Right. Or are you gonna take them to the old, sh you know, pierogi shop that's been there for 50 right. years that won't spend any money on marketing? Right, and that's, right. That's Can you find is. the off the beaten path opportunity? I think what you're talking about, Phil, is, is it actually belies a bigger trend in the world, which is one-to-one -one personalized marketing. Not just, playing to the cliche or the oversaturated or the, those with the biggest budgets. But he has an old song by the OJs out of Philadelphia that uh -oh. was, you gotta give the people what they want. Okay. okay? Now that obviously is a, a big concept, but I really have always thought that that's a brilliant, simplistic way of understanding marketing. Help me find things that I want, that I know I want, or that I didn't know I want, but you know I want because of other things I want. Okay. It's a lot of wants. But that's really where I think the opportunity for, <clears throat> excuse me, apps like that plus the confluence of apps with big data reside. And there's some things happening in marketing and big data. I'm not sure if you're familiar with like the Google algorithm with what they're doing. I certainly doing. am. They're, they're seeing if you're buying baby clothes that you actually go into this segment where they're gonna map out the next seven years of what ads they can give you. Like, that's well, right. You're gonna have a baby, you're gonna need this, and then you're gonna need this, and then when they're four years old, and then this is their birthday, you bought a birthday item. It is insane the amount of data that's being drawn on people, mm. which, a lot of people say that's big brother-ish, but mm -hmm. I would rather get targeted with ads that are actually relevant to me than ads that aren't. You got to give the people what they want. Yeah. I, I come back to that time and time again. You know, you take a look in the 1980s uh, when large consumer brands were not target marketing to their customers. In other words, uh, a young single guy like yourself might receive in the mail tons of unwanted information about Pampers diapers. What use would you have for that? Yep. So it goes back to the, the I don't want to say the early days of marketing, but at least in the, in the 20th century, when people started realizing, let's be more targeted, both with marketing and with selling. Um, I think that's another really great opportunity that the types of apps that we're talking about and the big data pieces that connect to it uh, offer the consumer, which is finding things that are not only relevant, but interesting, and then opportunities for organizations, cities, businesses, providers, to offer special incentives or discounts based on high value consumers. People with a propensity to spend. Mm -hmm. Now we're taking a look at economic data or we're talking about past purchase history. That's pretty exciting stuff. So I think it's less a big brother and there are clearly privacy issues that, that, that exist out there. Uh, a lot of people almost wish they could go off the grid completely. Yep. But the, the reality is when properly deployed and when ethically deployed, these types of marketing um, programs and systems offer great opportunity to people. Yeah, and it's gonna make everybody's lives easier. Yes. Marketing company isn't gonna have to blanket everybody in. And I like that, I like being able to target age groups and pass bys yes. and interests. And I'm very, when I buy my advertising, I get as targeted as I can. Yeah. And for me, it helps my response rate, it helps my sales. Sure. But it also, I feel like I'm not, I'm not being a jerk. I'm not spamming people. I'm not, I'm not throwing this ad to the lowest common denominator. That's right. And that's a problem I think a lot of marketing companies, the older marketing companies have. They, they've, they, have, they still have that old mindset of how that industry works. So, yeah. You know, like, we'll buy a magazine. Well, now there's so many niche magazines and niche everything, niche blogs and niches on niches and niches mm -hmm. that you just have to, it, it's a lot of the work now is actually finding where the best place is, looking at your uh, ROIs and co cost per clicks and cost that's per right. transactions. But you know, it's a, it's a changing world, but I think it's going to help everybody at the end of the day. I, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And the work that we do at Savier, and perhaps one of the reasons why I feel like it's such a great home for me, is we serve guys like you and I, the marketers, the CMO, uh, the chief marketing officer. And that doesn't literally have to be the title, but people that run the business, people that run the brand and run the sales operations and move the products and services. These individuals are in a very difficult position right now. Here's why. Technology is driving marketing 
like never before. Like never before. Digital has changed everything. But inherently, the best marketing people aren't left brain data analytic, you know, scientist type engineers. They're right brain creatives, they're branding experts, they're identity. They understand how to build the programs, the advertisements, and the campaigns yeah. that really bring the customer and but, humanize but you, the customer. But you also need to have that left brain analytics to look at the numbers and make sure that the right, it, it is unlike anything in history. That's right. Like it used to be creative running everything. That's right. And now it's, yeah, you need You that. don't have the luxury of being right brain only anymore. And, and the other challenge is that the CIO, the chief information officer or the chief technology officer, can't just be in the weeds, heads down, only looking at how do I fix these server problems that we're having and how do I, <laughs> how do I prevent people from hacking into my credit cards. Yeah. Those are real problems that the CIO deals with every day. So you have this problem and opportunity where the CMO and the CIO together must cross-pollinate. Yeah. They almost have to have skills the other have and they have to communicate and they have to work together to have an entire digital strategy on marketing that moves the right products and services based on data to the consumer. That's the only kind of companies that will really thrive in this new world. Have you heard of schmarketing? <laughs> no, I, this I, is I, new. Schmarketing. Someone just brought this up. I was doing a, a speaking event and they raised their hand and said, what do you think about schmarketing? I'm like, uh, okay, please explain. <laughs> um, and I guess there's new positions where the, these big corporations are hiring to bridge the sales and marketing together mm -hmm. with, the, with the automated marketing systems like HubSpot and Fusionsoft and ListRack. Yeah. And, and then you have, the, uh, you have the marketing and you have the sales and someone to connect the two of those to make sure they're working together hmm. because it's becoming more and more, it's less like, well, marketing generates the lead than hands up the sales. Right. It's, you're creating content um, and the sales team needs to be able to understand and absorb that content and then put it out there as well. Mm -hmm. So it's you, they're building, I guess, positions now where it's you're just linking the two of those and making sure they're on the same page and that the sales team knows what the marketing team is doing and the sales team knows what, uh, you know, vice versa with what's happening. So it's pretty cool stuff. The highest compliment that, that my team ever has received in, in the time that I've been in the industry, in the tech industry, was when the marketing team understands the salespeople and the salespeople respect and love the marketing team because they really speak each other's language. And that doesn't mean marketing just pushing out message for the salesperson who robotically, our sales team robotically goes out and delivers it. It's the fact that today the consumer shapes the brand. The consumer directs product development. Mm -hmm. Perhaps not directly, but inherently because of the fact that consumer preferences are so well known now, it, you can no longer just push product to people. You have to understand where they live, why they're buying, what they need, and the salespeople have to embrace the brand. You can no longer have these silos where IT is doing one thing, marketing is doing another, and over here the salespeople are talking about something that doesn't even match the other two. It has to be unified, it has to be centralized, and it has to be smooth. That's the, the inherent promise of brand authenticity. And I think brand authenticity is perhaps the biggest key for any company in any industry in this in this oh, era. I would 100 percent agree, and we're actually dealing with companies right now where it's a large cable company, for example. So cable companies are just historically bad. You know, they have bad reviews. People are just their, their fees are going up and up. They're bundling these packages together, mm -hmm. channels they don't want. Uh, they're going through a lot of stuff. So they said basically they don't they want to get involved in social media. They want to do YouTube. They want to get involved, but they don't want anyone to comment, hmm. and they don't want they don't want the, they want it to be one way. I said, why? Like, well, people write bad stuff about us. Yeah. I'm like, so do you want to know that bad stuff or not? Oh, right. no, we want to know it, but we don't want it to be public. But I'm like, this gives you a chance to address the issue and say, you know what, we're sorry. Sorry, you know, Tina, let's, how can I address this issue? We're going to do this. I appreciate your feedback. As a customer service rep, I'm going to HR or whoever you have manning it. You can then have a conversation and show the public you're addressing these problems. And I said, well, what's your number one complaint? And she goes, Oh, we just had to raise our uh, rates $10. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, why? It's not our fault. The baseball team, they just paid this baseball player all this money and it trickles down. It takes a little time. Mm -hmm. But when you have these celebrities and you have these sports players making more and more money, it ends up trickling in, trickling to the cable companies. Mm -hmm. They have to pay more to broadcast these games. So I said, why don't you explain that? No one knows that. You know, why don't you, instead of hiding behind it now, in, in, why don't you own the message? Now That's it's right. on your page instead of some forum or Yelp or Google review or ripoff report or any of these other places. You can have it on your page and actually address in real time and have a conversation and appear human. And you can see their eyes kind of light up. Her boss was in the, at the event. And, 
you can kind of, you just have to be able to explain. And I think we're both on the same page. Without question. That F feedback is a gift. And it's less about spinning a message and more about embracing why the situation has occurred. All of us have been in situations where we've had a less than pleasurable experience in a restaurant or a hotel or buying a car or whatever it might be. And then there are those other times where you could think without having to spend more than 10 seconds on it, what was a great experience that I've had in any of those occasions? What's the best restaurant you've been to in a while? What's the last time you really enjoyed tr a travel experience or made a purchase that just made you want to tell your friends about it? Brand evangelism, mm -hmm. right? The brands that understand that you can own that problem and not hide from it will understand that you're, you're doing more to mitigate damage than those who try to hide from it and, and do one-way conversations. That's not going to fly. Today, bad news will get out one way or the other, whether or not you try to keep it embargoed or not. It's just the reality. So I agree with you wholeheartedly, Phil. There is an, a, there's a, an absolute mandate to go out there and own the message on that. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, we're in a new age where it's hard for these, the bigger the company is, the longer they've been established, like oil and gas companies, I talk with them as well. Um, anything that's, where it's been around for I'd say more than 30 years, mm -hmm. they're usually, they didn't need social media, yeah. they didn't need internet, so right. it's hard for them to adapt. And you have someone usually at the top saying, well, I got here and I never had to use Facebook or I right. never had to use right. any of this. But they don't realize that that's where their market's changing. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to... When you get right down to it, we're talking about communication yeah. in various forms, in authentic forms, right? Authentic forms. There's one project that we're working on currently now for a, a global multinational company based here in Pittsburgh. I won't say who it is, but you'd know them okay. if I mentioned who they All are. Right. But the challenge that they have is not unique to their industry nor to the company. For 20, 30 years, they've struggled with knowledge management, mm -hmm. basically sharing information between the various groups and various offices that are all spread across the globe. Why it becomes a problem for this organization is people aren't sharing information, right? Mm -hmm. It costs the company millions of dollars and, and a lot of time. If you are working on a project and I'm working on a project at the same time, they may have commonality that we're not sharing. Okay. Right. In other words, it could take you two years to find out something I already know. Mm -hmm. But if they had a great knowledge management system, going back to communication, in place, they would be able it's to... It's like an intro web. That's exactly right. It, precisely that. Um, think of it as like Wikipedia on steroids. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're building for them. The beautiful thing about it is, in conversations with other companies, just in passing about what we're doing there, mm -hmm. we realize this is a huge problem all across the world. There are a lot of companies that say, we are really losing time and money and opportunity because we're not sharing information. So a lot of it goes back to communication. But do you, th is, so I know you work a lot now with larger companies. Yes. But I know you're, you had roots in startups. I mean, oh, that's yeah. how we met. Yeah. Do you think that that's an issue just with these larger uh, companies or should, sh is this an issue that smaller companies should focus it, on too? It's a great question, Phil, and you're absolutely right. We do a fair amount of work with large entities, but we're also working with early stage companies, with startups, with those that have, uh, you know, that first series A and they're yeah. trying to grow. Um, I would say the lion's share of the work we do, though, is, is with more established companies. Having said that, there's an amazing opportunity to take the lessons that we see with the startups and share that with these larger enterprises who are trying to be more agile and trying to be more adept at, at doing things for, with millennial employees and attracting and recruiting and, re and retaining that, that kind of talent and leveraging the kind of technologies that get those kind of people into these big entities. Mm -hmm. What does the startup have in common with the big company? They're going to be there eventually. Mm -hmm. So to your point, yes. Knowledge management in a small company, it may not require a formal electronic system to, to have it happen, but as they grow, it's going to become a problem. There's a big difference between having five employees and having 10 and having 50. Yep, huge. And uh, I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of early stage companies that have kind of lost their soul along the way as growth has occurred yep. and as, as success has occurred. So I think that there are lessons there that the communication is very important, brand authenticity, being able to um, really un have everyone on the same page as much as possible. And, and by that, I mean both electronic software that helps that, as well as policies in place. Policies may be too rigid a word, but best practices and a culture of well, sharing. Let me ask you, so we're gonna be having to wrap up here. I wanna find out what companies in Pittsburgh are you excited about? Is there any startups that you see happening that you're like, wow, this is gonna be something that can put Pittsburgh on the map? But there, like a there, Pittsburgh there base, so not many. like a, 
Not a company that's like, you know, like opening up an office here, but like some startups. I mean, I know you're not as, as involved, so I don't want to put you I, in I, I actually am. I still spend a fair amount of time involved in the early stage community okay, with great. my involvement with Blue Tree Allied Angels and through the Three Rivers Venture Fair, which we just had here in town. Um, and Savier, we were actually working with a number of really cool early stage companies. I'll tell you about one of them, Avere Systems. A-V-E-R-E. -E. If you've never heard of them, they're amazing. Now, they're slightly more mature than a very early stage company. They're venture capital backed and they've been around a couple of years, more than a couple, uh, maybe five or six, I think. Uh, these guys are one of the coolest companies in the city. They do the systems, the racking systems for movie production companies out in Hollywood. Oh, okay. Those types of movie companies that um, are producing things with 3D, like The Hobbit and Gravity, mm -hmm. often almost always, run on Avere Systems, SAN Systems, hmm. okay? Area network, storage. Okay. Why I'm excited about them? Their growth is incredible. Their team is impeccable. We're fortunate they've turned to us since day one for a lot of the heavy lifting web work and, and, and online bill pay, or, uh, excuse me, online ticketing systems and really everything for their customer facing uh, uh, presence. They're a hot company. I think they're going to be acquired you know, sooner rather than later. I mean, I don't have that How on How come I never heard of them? I'm like a Pittsburgh tech guy. I you never check them out. Yeah, are they, they getting out there? They, 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 they are, believe me, they're out where they need to be. Yeah. Sometimes there are a lot of companies that make a lot of noise and there's a lot of sizzle but there's not a lot of stake. Yeah. That's the challenge of the early stage companies, is finding those that have a true sustainable model, real value for the marketplace, high barriers to entry so that they can't get eclipsed by a, you know, a, mm -hmm. a new competitor, and frankly, great exit potential. Um, other companies that I'm really excited about in town. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that there are almost too many to list, but <laughs> yeah. what, Maven Machines, which is in Alpha Lab gear, mm. uh, full, full disclosure, we are in discussions with them about potentially helping them. Uh, they can use it. They're doing some really cool technology for truckers uh, so that they don't fall asleep at the wheel. I met them. Okay. I met so them. I think, cool were they company. at Mill? Uh, they point? were, probably. Yeah, uh, they are in Alpha Lab gear presently. Great leadership, amazing team, very clean pitch. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're very well received. They're, they're really super. Hillion is another company, again, in the trucking industry that's revolutionizing the way that kinetic energy is used to change the way fleets are managed. Okay. Check them out. They're really hot. Um, again, some of these are, you know, maybe not on the tip of the tongue of everybody in town. Yeah. Um, well, let's get them involved. Let's well, get them yeah, involved sure. in tech events. When you're talking to these companies, there's so many cool events. And I feel like a lot of these startups, they just don't know of everything that's happening. So yeah. introduce them to me. I, I will, will show them all the <laughs> cool <laughs> festivals going on. We'll get them involved. Yeah. Like, just get the tech Well, don't community. forget, we have uh, uh, Innovation Works, Alpha Lab, and Alpha Lab Gears Demo Day coming up, in, in I believe, uh, the week after next. Uh, yeah. Coming up very soon. I'm going to try to make it. I try to be there. Here. We need to see you on the scene. Well, yeah. We're going to have to wrap up here. Christopher, it's been great. Phil, thank I, you. I appreciate you for coming on. I, and I'm great. Hopefully, we periscoped or Facebooked uh, correctly <laughs> on there. And yeah. that just wasn't uh, yeah. all for nothing. We've, so. we've more cameras than the uh, the Republicans or the Democrats combined. I know. Combined. This is like crazy. <laughs> but thanks a lot, Christopher. I really it was a pleasure, it. Phil. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. Thanks. One, two, three, four. Get my shoes and out the door. Five. I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great, nine, gonna shine, life is good, I'm doing fine, ten, gonna do it right and do it again, yeah. I look into the sky with all the beautiful color, but there's more than just for me, so gonna share it with another. I got two show to give, let out, I want to sing and shout, take a look.